in that sport, if you don't perfect the first three pieces of the climb, you're going to fall. You don't get to the next stage, right? So he compared it to surfing. He said, look, in, in surfing, if you have a bad pop up, poor speed generation and a crappy bottom turn, you can still fumble your way along to a cutback attempt. Rock climbing, you fall at the bottom turn, you don't get to do the, the cutback attempt. There's so much emotions, there's so much noise, there's so much excitement, as I mentioned, at something like the Olympics. And it's, it is exactly that, just managing your athletes' energy, their mindset, their belief, and just keeping them level-headed and grounded. Welcome back to the Surf Mastery Podcast. Today's guest is Matt Scorringe. Matt is a former pro surfer turned coach, and Matt was one of the original guests on the show back in 2016, episode number five. Today we talk about Matt's time as the surf coach to the New Zealand Olympic team leading up to the Games and about his experiences at the event itself. We talk about what the role of a surf coach is at the Olympics and how his role as a surf coach to the average surfer has adapted to the online medium post-COVID, plus much more. You can find out more about Matt at theartofsurfing.com. Matt is also offering listeners a discount to his online surfing academy, his educational platform, and a bonus for those that sign up to his remote coaching. Details and links to that stuff are in the show notes and at surfmastery.com. And without further ado, here is my conversation with Matt Scorridge. It's been a while since we chatted. Tell me about the Olympics. What was that experience like? I think just to summarize it, it's obviously been a question a lot of people have asked me since going to that is, it just was one of the most exciting times of my life, really. Everything was so exciting from just the team villages, you know, the New Zealand team and, and the way in which they welcomed you and made you a part of the team, surfing venue, just watching the action and yeah, everything the entire time was full of excitement and you know as a coach you're allowed to be excited and get pretty heightened but you know for the athletes that was trying to manage that excitement and keep them you know <laughs> in a state of mind to to do the job at hand but um yeah just a, an incredible experience that's for sure how many surfers went with you we had two surfers in the team so you could total in total you could have had four athletes per country um we unfortunately missed out Paige Harab just missed out by literally one spot by, you know, at the ISA World Titles um, earlier that year. So that was a bit of a shame. We could have had three, but yeah, we had Billy and Ella. So we had male and female and, you know, to have two athletes there out of the, the, the 40 in total, it was pretty cool for New Zealand to be a part of that, you know, first year that surfing was in the Olympics. Yeah. Well, that's nice for you as a coach too, just to have two to manage. Ideally, it'd be yeah, one. it was, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I'm so used to running campaigns with our our you know New Zealand teams for say the junior titles where we have 12 athletes or even the open we have six. So having only two was yeah, it was it was really nice. It was really, I really enjoyed being able to focus in on them both and separate what they individually needed. You know, to a to a more large capacity, I could I could spend time understanding what they needed you know, in different ways. And they're very different athletes, very different athletes. So that was nice. And, you know, over my career, I've mostly worked with groups, as I just mentioned. And so it was, yeah, it was really cool to kind of break that all down and, and grow as a coach out of that experience on how you can, you know, how much more you can actually help surfers when you're just focusing on, a, you know, less, less surfers. Working with one would be, I would be, it'd be pretty amazing be, not to say easy is the wrong word, but it would be a lot, a lot more attainable to kind of know exactly what those that athlete needs, right, on any given day. Mm. So, what did you from? I mean, when you probably remember the day you got the call, hey, you're going with these two athletes to the Olympics. That whole period, including you know closing closing ceremony, what what, what did you take away from that? What did you learn as a coach from that whole experience? Yeah, man, that's a that's a big question. Um, you know, the the crazy thing just to answer the first part about it, 
you know, being involved heavily with surfing New Zealand for so long and running the high performance program here and, and being the Olympic pathway coach, you know, had that title leading into actually being, the, you know, um, officially selected. It was such a huge journey because of COVID as well. You know, the Olympics being pushed back, not knowing if our, you know, we would qualify athletes um, from New Zealand, uh, not even knowing the, the real qualification process for so long. And then even when we qualified, to athletes or they qualified themselves i should say at the isa world titles that was never confirmed until around maybe three to four months before the olympics that they were officially going because it then becomes new zealand uh the you know the nzoc the new zealand olympic committee's decision on whether they want to send those athletes and they they feel they are worthy of of going right because it, it costs them a lot of money and they want to make sure they've got potential medal contenders or at least people that can can get a reasonable result so we were we were all still unsure for quite a large time and so yeah it was it was an amazing relief to know we were officially going um obviously the athletes more importantly had done all the hard work it would have been you know quite hard for them but in the end it was always a shoe in but we just it just took that long to get the confirmation so um but yeah the, to answer the second piece of your question I think the biggest piece that I learned and sitting there watching all the other coaches with, you know, you know, Gabby's coach and Italo's coach and Carissa and all of these, you know, world champions and watching their coaches was just how much, you know, they relied on the trust of their coach. So it wasn't all the technical stuff. It wasn't all of the, you know, the equipment stuff like those athletes are so dialed in, but just mostly how much at that level, and and this was across all sports, being able to watch, you know, different coaches from all sports. It was just that trust and that relationship, you know, building that out with your athletes and how important that is on that day, you know, to be that second head on their shoulders. Just helping to manage their own self-doubt. Yeah, it's one of those things like a lot of people ask, like, oh, what do you do when you coach surfing, right, initially? And you can get into the technique and the strategy and, and then – you know, there was a post going round of a, a certain ex-pro surfer saying just recently, like from that WSL uh, Final Five comp and, you know, the World Title Day saying, you know, what are these coaches actually doing? And it's it's funny because, you know, he's saying these guys and girls are so good. What do they need on the day? But there's so much emotions. There's so much noise. There's so much excitement, as I mentioned, at something like the Olympics. And it's, it is exactly that, just managing your athletes' energy, their mindset, their belief, and just keeping them level-headed and grounded. And then, you know, getting them into the right, I guess, frame of mind, but into that right space energetically as well before the heat. And I mentioned earlier how different Billy and Ella were as athletes. And, you know, just to give examples, Billy really needs to be running like on a high energy, like almost bouncing up and down, sort of a chillo vibes where, you know, he's just ready to run up the beach and just catch a million waves. And Ella was very different. She needed to be calm. She needed like not to be hearing all the noise. She needed to be away from everyone. Like she needed a, her own specific quiet space and routine to not let the pressure and the nerves, you know, build. And so just seeing signs in them that, that, that they're getting affected, moving them away, you know, just managing them in those in those moments is really just one of the biggest roles, I think. I mean, they they know how to surf. They know their equipment. You, know, you can certainly help with a strategy based on the uh, competitor or the conditions, but they're all pretty astute in that area too, right? And so if someone else is controlling, helping them control their, their I guess, their mindset, that is what I think was the biggest takeaway. Hmm, interesting. So just helping them to focus on the task at hand rather than getting pulled in every direction. They're probably getting people asking for interviews and autographs and i can imagine it's just everything about a surfing competition is 10x intensified because of the olympics and the hype and and it just it has the ability to take away from what they're there to do i guess definitely you know i mean just when we arrived and we got to that village they would they would like two kids in a candy store you know there was just so much going on and they got nicknamed you know by the new zealand team you know basically they're both just bouncing around the walls just so excited and they just they just got called the bubble couple because they were just so like bubbly and you know having such a fun time and it was really good for them like they thrive off that and they got so much media attention out of it like you know 
here in New Zealand, they were across the TV, radio shows, everything, because they just had, it was the new cool sport, right? With a male and female, they're both very marketable, very like, just, you know, their personalities are, are, are very fun and the energy is really attractive. And so everyone wanted a piece of them. And literally they were, you know, one or they were the two of only six athletes chosen by the New Zealand team to walk on the opening ceremony as well. And that was the night before we had to <clears throat> travel out to the venue and uh, it was the day before the comp. So they had basically, and they didn't finish that night till like two in the morning. So it was full on. So, you know, they're up to two in the morning at the opening ceremony to get up in the morning, move to the contest venue. The comp starts the very next day. We couldn't even surf the venue. I think it was two days or three days out. It opened just because of all the COVID protocols. So yeah, it was, it was a really busy different what time you know not a normal lead up into an event and then you're there for one of the biggest surfing moments of your career you know so yeah it was really really easy to be distracted and overwhelmed and that was kind of the main thing I was trying to trying to manage as a coach a terrible night's sleep and then you're going to surf <laughs> somewhere you've never surfed before it's like the the worst lead up to to a surfing <laughs> to, to a surf well yeah, I mean, admittedly, we um we had been there the two days prior training, as I said, but the swell had been one to two foot, like really, really small. And mm. then the day before was the arrival of that first, you know, obviously, you know, if you remember the comp, it, it got quite big and stormy, right? With um the sort of hurricane that that came through and so the typhoon. So it really was going to be sort of chalk and cheese in terms of what they were training and to what we were going to get and yeah they made the decision as athletes that hey this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to walk on an opening ceremony for my country and yeah they they decided they wanted to stay an extra night at the village because we could have moved out a, a, a night early and and i and i didn't judge them on that i understood it you know i think i would have done the same thing if, if i was to be completely honest and we just managed it the best we could they they left earlier than other athletes they um you know we gave them a sleeper and we got out there and the swell had arrived it was completely different they had to ride different boards and they'd been training on and then yeah had to get up the day after and, and surf so it worked out they both made their heats that next day but um as you say definitely not the best training or lead into an event and but it was very similar like for all the athletes you yeah. know a lot of the surfers were all in the opening ceremony because it was that new sport and they were invited to do so as a and, and no one said no to my understanding Mm. Well, this kind of alludes to something that I think is pretty common in surfing is that you have to be so adaptable as a surfer, even just the, the weekend warrior. You, you don't really know what it's going to be like when you turn up. And maybe, you know, one of your maybe one of your kids was up spewing till two in the morning, but you still want to go surfing with your buddies and you turn up. You have to learn to manage. I guess you have to manage your adrenaline and, and all sorts of things and adapt to the conditions and that's what these guys are so good at right the pro yeah program. definitely and that's what you're yeah. kind of there to help them do right you don't want them to just you want to make sure their nervous system is calm and they want to they want to ramp themselves up just before they warm up for their surf really so that's a big yep. part of that's a big part of surfing as well i think is you, there's so much life for just for the average surfer there's so much life you have to manage you know, before your surf and after your surf and in and around surfing, especially if you're surfing, um, you know, tricky conditions. What are some of the strategies you use to help, for example, in the Olympics, to help them stay calm and not just burn all the energy out of all that excitement and, and other obligations? Yeah, good question. You know, and I actually have to give a shout out to Dave Wood and another another guy that was involved in the New Zealand team, Campbell, who was our sports site guy. And basically they, we, or we, uh, myself and Billy and Ella were fortunate to work with them in the lead up. And so their their main tasks were to help us have tools to do the, the, you know, new excitement that they knew would come. So the New Zealand team um, wrapped around us some support, knowing that as new athletes and a new coach, we would be overwhelmed. We would be excited that they could tell Billy and Ella were going to be the media darlings of, of the team. And so some of those strategies were um, just a sort of every second night we were zooming back into New Zealand with Dave Wood 
he's you know just an expert in his space of controlling nerves under pressure and he works with a lot of UFC fighters and a lot of it's you know what's getting quite common around the place now with just you know breathing exercises but he would just take us through different types of box breathing and uh sort of you know talking over the top of us as we're going into these meditative states to just bring ourselves back and regulate that that nervous system and and kind of calm ourselves before these big days and the first time he, he he zoomed in and we'd been there I think three days at this point you know we were just we were just buzzing man it, it really reminded us of why we were there the job at hand and so a lot of the things I do with my role is just reinforce reinforce these things you know that experts in these areas taught me or taught taught the athletes another one of the sessions we've been doing with the sports psych guy Campbell from the New Zealand team he sat with us um, or met up with us a few times beforehand and just got to understand what made them both happy you know and it's as simple as just thinking about in, in both of their cases they just would think about who their favorite person to surf what with was at what spot you know your local spot what sort of did the waves look like what did the air smell like what could you see what could you hear you know what turns were you doing what was the board you're on what were they just all the details that remind you of your happy place and I know it can sound a little I don't know you know sort of been and done or, or a little cheesy but it worked it really brought both of them back to the inner child that wanted to surf for the right reasons that loved the sport and now look at you you're at the Olympics and it just gave them that feeling of pride and success and no matter no matter how I perform as long as I do my best you know, I can be proud of myself. And so I think that takes away for a lot of athletes, the pressure, you know, the surrounding pressure and, and, you know, whether it's trying to do it for sponsors or parents or other people, you, you kind of start to look at it from, you know, why, why you started out on this journey and it, um, it really helped, it really helped them. And I just look to reinforce those things over the course of the, of the um, campaign. Mm. I'm sure it helped you as a coach as well absolutely yeah i mean we're coaches are human too um <laughs> we get excited we get caught up in the noise and you know the the kind of all, all the media and everything so yeah i was i was buzzing out myself and um you know i was the first one that had to check myself and kind of use those strategies to you know i need to be kind of regulating my my myself right to be able to give them the you know my best and and help them as well so I know you were just you were just recently in Bali with a group, and but while you were there, I'm sure you, I'm going to assume you were doing some of your own surfing while you were there as well. I'm just wondering is is there anything that you now do or have included in your your daily life daily routine that you learned from the Olympics from that experience? The thing is about you know a surf coach is when you finally get to surf you're just so eager to get out there you can you can kind of maybe not practice what you preach a little bit because you know particularly in my case right now with just a young family and a busy work schedule and and you know you finally get those windows but so so there's there's a lot of the like the mid well let's say the mindset stuff that I that I reinforce that I can I can kind of brush over but one thing that I have learned through years now of of um coaching it you know re-delivering you know the information that I've heard from from those that are experts in the area is you can tap into those spaces a lot quicker so for me it is I am always looking to and and, and you can almost get it down to a, a one breath and I, I know you've spoken with other people on this podcast actually now that just kind of jumped into my mind about you know the importance of breath work and and the and the way in which you know it might take someone else two to three minutes to get to a state where others it, it can be one breath and I feel like the key thing I look to always try and remind myself is just how lucky I am to be here and so in Bali a prime example is just how crowded it can get at places like Padang and you might not be having the best session and it can literally take just one breath to find that inner child that like that inner child version of me of what would have looked at this moment and just been like you kidding me I'm out at Padang with like Rizal and Petit and they're getting all the ways I'm not but like just you know you're getting flustered you're getting kind of maybe a bit angry not at them but just the situation and so using those those breathing techniques to kind of calm myself down and just just be a lot more grateful for where I'm at. Um, I use multiple times in a session even now 
and I really find it helps me just yeah surf with ease and flow and and you know lose the tension and and kind of get in more of that flow state with with my surfing yeah interesting that raises a good point and something that's I haven't heard mentioned too much though it's sort of most sports psychologists and stuff will say hey look meditate and mm. these strategies that have become really common and that you sort of d- dived into a little bit more through through Dave Wood but there's something that's not often mentioned is that the more you do that the more you do in the beginning it might be a struggle to meditate for 10 minutes and and think about your inner child and it might feel forced and kooky or whatever but if you just do it then after years of doing it and then and of course as a coach you, you're always talking about it and teaching it as well so you it's kind of reinforced as well but just for the general athlete and the general person i think what at first it's going to feel like tough and a waste of time etc but the more you practice it the easier it is to get into it and you get to the point where it can literally be one or two breaths and just reminding yourself and then boom you're there and that's that's something we see we get little snippets of, I think. Kelly Slater taps. Kelly, you see Kelly Slater tapping the water. Mick Fanning rubs his hands, sort yep. of shakes his body, and you, you see him doing that on the beach with headphones on at first to get into the zone. And then, if he has a bad wave, you see him do it quickly while he's waiting for a set. Yeah. And that's totally. They've learned. They've put the time in. They've worked with sports yep. psychologists and, and and stuff, and and learned how to meditate. And they've put the time. We don't see that, and it pays off in the end. Because then once you, once you get experience at it, it can happen reasonably quickly. Absolutely. And, you know, just to like firm up what I was saying, like working with the sports psych guy from the New Zealand team, like for me in my space with what I do is, as a coach, I wasn't aware of a lot of the importance, um, you know, for Olympic athletes to to spend a lot of time in preparation working with someone in that area. And we were advised and we had our hand held by the New Zealand team to do so. And I just sort of thought, cool, you know, I'm, I'm stoked for my athletes and I'm stoked I can do this. But by the end of it, I was just in complete awe and amazement at what this guy was doing with us and what I learned, what our athletes learned. And you know, that just the stuff that Mick and all those elite athletes have been doing for so long. And we just think of it like it's just some weird habit they might have before they paddle out. But there's you know hours and hours and hours of backstory and then getting to that moment where a simple rub of the hands can completely uh, mitigate all this outside noise and pressure and i i have no idea how they do it at that uh, you know that intense level i you know i feel you know grateful to have learned these strategies and be able to use it just in a general free surf to just just knock off some frustration when you're having a bad surf or you know the crowd's working against you or you're just not in rhythm and just resetting your your mind just to try and just get into rhythm on a, an everyday surf, you know? So yeah. And I like to, I like to kind of teach that to my recreational clients as well, just to help them get out of funks and, and um, change the flow of a surf or, or, or um, sort of nip that bad rhythm in the butt and, and have an opportunity to, to kind of bounce back in a surf. Yeah. It's a good segue. So tell me how, how has your, you know, home base, your, your coaching practice, at home here in New Zealand, how's that changed and evolved after COVID? Oh man, it's it's a completely different, yeah, completely different business now. It's obviously very common that you know all businesses and um, particularly you know coaches of any sort and and uh, sport coaches, I think more even more particularly, have had to kind of build into the um, technology side of this this way of delivering our services. So for me, the main uh, big change has just been the growth of remote coaching. So I obviously went to the Olympics, which was fantastic. It really helped me also launch, I guess, to another level with people's awareness of what I do. And let's face it, respecting what I do, you know, people out there that weren't, they surf, but didn't think surf coaching could help them. And then they see surfing as an Olympic sport and they see Olympic coaches. It really changes people's mindsets to give that a go. And so I've had a whole lot more inquiry and and people from all around New Zealand and the world. And you can only be in so many places. There's only so many hours in the day. So yeah, it's been an exciting journey to launch my remote coaching service and, you know, now helping people literally all around the world in New York and Brazil, Australia, 
you know, through technology and still seeing incredible results. So uh, I think COVID has changed a, a lot for people's acceptance of learning online, which was really good, a really good benefit for uh, myself and other other coaches. So a Zoom call or, you know, an app that you're, you're going back and forth in with, uh, you know, video analysis and, um, you know, that kind of feeling more comfortable just to see people through a screen uh, then in person so um, yeah it's changed a lot yeah and I mean you've got the academy as well which you, you've got a database of like educational videos as well which goes yep. along with that right yeah definitely yeah because in in the terms of business like I've done a lot of I've read a lot of business books I've done a lot of online learning about business but it wasn't until recently I got a business mentor who was able to help me sort of bring that information and that knowledge into practical terms because I was feeling so frustrated I, could, I didn't know how to apply all of this knowledge specific to my needs so once I got the business mentor she just helped helped me just integrate all this knowledge only from all this reading I'd been in inspiration I'd been looking at other you know into my own personal strategies is it do you think that's a similar thing of what happens with surfers because there's a lot of educational information out there for surfing now yeah yes yeah. how does it fit into my surfing that's 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 i think the piece that's missing yeah you've you've absolutely hit the nail on the head like i was apps you know i was one of those coaches and there's been a few of us that with covid started to produce online content for learning i mean it was just the way the world went and I was very lucky. I had been planning to do that already for some time before COVID was around. So I literally launched my academy with my library of content, I would say, two weeks after our lockdown started here in New Zealand. And at that point, most people were just starting to think, oh, I now need to change tack. Um, so yeah, I'm really grateful that I had that idea already and was ahead of that curve. So I launched in early 2020 and it went it went really well i signed up you know a large amount of members instantly and had a great community and was delivering what i was really proud of in terms of a product of content but then of course you know the world opened back up and people get back to the real life and they start surfing again actually and i start coaching in person and the one thing that really stood out to me over the next 12 months was you could only, well, I found I could only get my members to improve so much through just purely learning via video or online. And, you know, even the, the sort of top, you know, uh, percentage of those students that improved the most, they were, they were really dedicated to the land-based training to then take that into the water. Anyone that was just visually watching it, like kind of binging Netflix, you know, some of them had little uh, improvement really show up in their surfing. And that's not a knock on anyone's content, whether it's mine as my content or another coach's. It's just the key missing piece, which is, you know, personal intervention of what they need to actually focus on. So I then redesigned the academy over the next six months and changed it so that the the kind of, I guess, the, you know, main hierarchy of, you know, the value proposition was that as a member of the Art of Surfing, you do get an annual review from me. So you submit it and you can then use the content as the supporting, you know, learning education to further understand how you can improve these key pieces I'm going to help, you know, or, or a, a Art of Surfing coach will help you identify. Um, and as soon as I've done that, it's just changed the whole scope of what, what my members are getting in terms of actual progression. I mean, it's obvious, but... I just wanted to create a model that it wasn't about giving a little bit to a lot of people. I wanted to give a lot to a, you know, a few people and actually truly have transformation in my members. And yeah, it's been a great journey and I'm, I'm really happy I took that change in direction because I'm getting to know my members more personally, you know, it's, it's more of a community. I'm literally, it's like friends almost. And yeah, you can't have thousands and thousands of members, but you know, those those hundreds you are helping, you're making more of an impact, and yeah, it's it's um it's been really enjoyable. Mm. What what's the most um objections that you get to this process? Is it the fact oh I can't get good footage of myself? Is that the main? Of course, <laughs> and and I I have been 
you know, I think myself and all the coaches out there, we've been off, everyone's been offering, you know, that sort of, hey, buy a video review, one off this much, I'll do one turn this much, I'll do three turns this much, I'll do your whole surfing. So it's nothing new there, but, and we've always been fighting the fact that people can't get footage. But for me, with this new product, it's it's not about saying, hey, you know, you need footage right now. It's it's You've got a year membership. So in that space of a year, you're going to get some footage if you really want to. And I've got, you know, resources on my, within my academy about how people can achieve that. You know, obviously there's solo cams, there's 4K cameras you can film really pulled back. So it's just filming the whole lineup and then chop in. I've got one client in New York that does that. And the footage is fantastic for reviewing. And he's literally filming like, there could be like seven people up on different waves all in the widescreen, but he zooms into himself and crops it. And it's fantastic. I also filmed on my iPhone. I did a um, an eight person course where I only use my iPhone for a day to coach. And so I filmed them on my iPhone. I coached them on my iPhone and it was as successful in terms of progression than any other way of doing it. No, it's not as easy because, you know, you've got to put more effort into um, sort of sit with everyone individually and show them the review. But the iPhone, if you zoom in and you film someone on a normal beach break, obviously not like a long point break, you're getting all, all the movement patterns you need for your coach to see what you're doing wrong. And so particularly with, I mean, the iPhone 14 coming out and all that, it's they're better than most cameras, to be honest. And so there's no excuse that you can't get your dad, your mum, your daughter, you know, your wife, a good mate. Go down with your mate that also wants to get improvement, catch three waves each and stand at the, you know, the water's edge with an iPhone. Job done. Send it mm. into your coach. You're going to be a better surfer. <laughs> Yeah, and as a coach, that's all you need too. Sometimes all you need to see is like two seconds, and you like, okay, you just you just know, oh, just you you can just awesome. tell by the way they, you can tell what their attitude is as they're popping up. There's so as a co- I think people don't realize that as a coach, you can read so much off of potentially a really a wave that you're obviously not going to be proud of. I mean, there's no point getting footage of you surfing your best in overhead waves. It's it's that's nice. But I think yeah. people need to realize that how little we need as coaches to, to, to make a really good assessment and to make it personal. Yeah. And yeah, with the technology nowadays, like, yeah, iPhone, someone standing on the beach with an iPhone is all you need. It is it is all you need. And and you, it, you've you just said, I've got one client in LA, he had the same issue. And I, I jumped on a Zoom call with him and had a, you know, our first session. And I said, with my remote coaching package, and I said, get your friend and he did and they went down he got three waves on a two-foot day and it was on shore and i produced 16 minutes of review out of that that will and he that would you know i know the number because he replied to me and went i cannot believe you have produced 16 minutes of review from those three crappy waves and i said look i can see everything you know your pop the way that you're not generating speed off the mark you're extended through your bottom turn there's no rotation through your, you know it was just all clear as day you know, as you say, it doesn't doesn't need to be at J Bay on a six foot to see those those things not showing up. What about uh, the Surfline Rewind? Is that good enough? Yeah, that one's that one's touch and go. Um, 50-50 would be the best way to describe it. There's beaches that it's nice and close, and so it does work. And then there's spots where it's just too pixelated and too far away. So yeah, I say to all my members, look, grab it, send it in, and I'll let you know if it's going to be sufficient. Uh, but I mean, gosh, places like Changu, you know, as an example, or Huntington, there's there's so many waves that it is fine. You can't zoom in as much as you'd like because it gets pretty pic- pixelated. But if you can see enough, you can at least bring in a module and then speak to it based off a module. Um, so, hey, this is where you would be pulling the arm this way and this is where you want to be pulling it. So you still get the job done. And so I always say to my members, you know, let's try it and we'll see how we go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's hit and miss. Some cams are close, like Malibu and stuff, but yeah, a lot of them are so mm. far away. So when you say land-based training, what, what do you mean by that? Well, for me, land-based training means just trying to feel the movements in any way possible. So obviously there's been a massive, you know, burst of this surf skate training styles, um, which I think serves a really important place. I use it a lot with clients when we have the time, but it's not necessarily the only way to do it. 
And so a lot of my land-based training is all just about showing my members what the movement would feel like on land. So they can, they can actually just simulate it. And it may just be standing in front of the mirror and just like pretending you're on that wave and that whole, you know, not to at all uh, sort of copy off anyone, but I think Brad Gerlich has done a great job with his wave key. I think that that style is effective and, you know, he's got a real art in which he does it in a real unique way, but just to kind of distill it down into just simulation of movements. So you feel how much rotation I'm asking you to achieve through your back and bottom turn to get your chest to actually face the lip line. And so if they're not getting some reps on the board somewhere with that outside of the water, it's going to be hard to know what that range of movement truly feels like and how far to go with that. Uh, and this, you know, I have some clients, one guy in New York particularly, who is just so committed to that piece of the process that his progression recently has even blown me away um, as a coach that's coached thousands of people all over the world, how quickly his progress has blown me away by really, you know, making sure he goes through that land-based training honestly obsessively you, your normal person probably wouldn't do do it the way he does but his background is professional rock climbing so his training in that area it, you know he said to me look in that sport if you don't perfect the first three pieces of the climb you're going to fall you don't get to the next stage right so he, he compared it to surfing he said look in, in surfing if you have a bad pop-up poor speed generation and a crappy bottom turn you can still fumble your way along to a cutback attempt rock climbing you fall at the bottom turn you don't get to do the, the cutback attempt you're falling to the ground so he said it's so detrimental that you perfect all the foundations to get there and he said the only way to do that was just obscenely amount you know amounts of repetition of that particular part of the climb or that particular hold or you know, whatever it might have been in that sport um, and he's just taken that approach to um, surfing and uh, it's really impressed me. Yeah, that's interesting. That's such a, such a great lesson from rock climbing that's so applicable. Mm. I guess if you're serious, if, if you are serious about improving your surfing, you, you, you can't skip. There's no skipping that. There's no, hey, I want to work on my top turn. It's no, hold on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hold on. You're going to need some speed, some speed first. You've got to catch the right wave first. Yeah. And it's... It's, the thing is, is I mean, surfing's changing. And we've got coaches and you know people doing this embodied movement practice, which has a true. I mean, every other sport or, or martial art, it's this is just it's part of it. It's ingrained. Music, yeah. you know what I mean? There's, a, there's a, you, you want to be a musician. There's a certain amount of playing. We all want to play music, but you have to practice in order to yeah. be able to play tennis you got to practice before you play otherwise no one's going to play with you if you can't do it yeah, <laughs> yeah. so true yeah but that's it, why we love surfing right is we can um we can we can just do it like you are you're enjoying it in the act of practicing and there's so many other sports like you say tennis like you can't just i mean you can practice as you play your friend but if you're wanting to play a good player you can't you can't practice in that moment because they're just going to hit the ball back at you and you're not going to get it. So <laughs> I've always found it interesting with a lot of sports that when you're not, you know, when you're not playing it, you know, as let's say rugby, professional rugby players or, or NRL players, you know, when they retire, that's it. They don't do the sport again. You, you don't play it anymore. You can practice it, but that's not playing it. Whereas surfing, you retire, you still surf. You're still practicing. You're still doing it while practicing. You know, it's the same thing um, because it's an individual sport, obviously. Mm. But there's a lot of sports that aren't. They take two people to play it, right? I mean, golf would be similar to surfing, but tennis is not. Rugby is not. You know, it's any form of racing is not. So we're really fortunate. I've always, I think that's why it's got to be the fastest growing sport globally. There's, you know, so much people that are starting in adulthood now with it being such a, like, popular sport and they just fall in love with it like my friend neil in new york who is the climber he's come from this obsessive background in other sports and he's just fallen in love with the fact he can do it and practice while doing it you know which is quite unique to a lot of people that 
didn't just grow up with surfing as you know a childhood sport they just could do any other day at the beach and yeah i think that's an interesting point too with the land-based training if you if you get your if you put your if you take the fins off your board and, and put your surfboard on a yoga mat and do practice your pop-ups jumping up and down on your board it's probably the perfect way to ruin your surfboard <laughs> yeah true <laughs> that's not that's not right <laughs> yeah so we're, we're not talking about doing that let's just make that clear. Uh, and look i i i've got to be honest i've got content in my academy where i where i have done that just to show placements right but um where your hands would be where your where your feet would be but some people I, look one thing i've learned as a coach everybody needs different types of information delivered in different types of ways you know it's so many different learning styles it's, you never know what in which way it's going to kind of connect with what individual and that's why i really recommend people try different coaches in any given sport is they're probably going to say the same thing because we all know what we're looking at like in terms of hey let's just give an example like there's no compression in your bottom turn but they are going to deliver it differently to me or i'll deliver it differently to them and you just don't know which voice and which way will connect and so with my coaching i always try and give as many versions of the same piece of information visually verbally even you know several types of ways in which i say it several types of ways in which i show up visually in my online content or in a live you know review session and it's funny i've had so many clients that might have been with me for a while or i've said it three or four times in one way and then i say it a different way and they're like, oh, I wish you'd said that at the start. That makes sense. <laughs> and you're like, well, I just didn't know which iteration was going to click for you. You know, I've got eight other people in the room or, you know, thousands of other people in the membership. Like you, you just got to throw enough mud at the wall as a coach sometimes. The eighth time you explain something to someone and they finally get it, that happens through a relationship with a coach. Yeah. That's, that's exactly what, that's why you have a coach for those moments that's why you spend a thousand dollars on five hours of coaching and you finally get it and then it makes all that all of those years of learning finally start to make sense and then then the, the coaching relationship builds even further and next thing you know oh wow i'm surfing so much better the first 10 the last year of one's surfing with a coach you might learn more in that in that one year of working with a coach than you did in your first 10 years of surfing yeah definitely yeah, there's kind of two things that come to mind as you say that. Like the first is how many parents have said to me, you know, they've put their kids in and they're, they're, they're trying to say the same message often, you know. There's obviously lots of parents that have good surfers. They know what they're looking at. They see their kid. It's pretty clear what they're not doing, but their kids just won't listen to them. <laughs> or they just don't hear them the way they say it. And then you get them along and you deliver it certainly in a more professional way using your you know your review technology and all that kind of layers of coaching techniques you have but this the parent has that smile on the face like oh i've been banging my head against the wall on that for so long and then yeah to your other point like just that that really makes me think about the athletes i've been working with with a, for a long time and you know the newer the athlete the more you say like the longer you've been working with them the less you say and and that's my my learning anyway like when I work with someone like, you know, particularly if they're at an elite level, but someone like Billy, who I went to the Olympics with, and, you know, we've been either surfing together, good friends, and working together for so long now, it was just the smallest of conversations or the smallest of, like, little nods from me. And it means, you know, the backstories are there behind all of that. They know what you mean. You don't need to kind of come at them from eight different ways. And so, yeah, the more <sighs> someone puts in time with a coach, definitely the, the more they're going to get out of it in the long run. Okay. So how do people find out more about you and potentially sign up for some coaching? How does it work? Yeah. So just through uh, my website, theartofsurfing.com, I have pretty clear, uh, I guess, you know, guides on there in terms of uh, in-person and online coaching. And so I have the membership, which is our kind of like base level online coaching experience where you get the access to all the content and an annual review. And for those that want to take it to the next level um, and actually do the remote coaching, uh, I have a remote coaching cohort program. So it's a three-month intensive, you know, coaching uh, with me via 
my app that I use and you know the next cohort intakes in November uh, it's a really limited spot so I only take sort of 15 people each time just so I can give them that quality and you know look to actually make that change in their surfing so yeah that's all uh on the website and you can find information about that there awesome well i'll put links to all of that stuff in the show notes matt again thank you so much for your time we need to do this again no more often definitely yeah i appreciate it and also i just want to say speaking to the notes in, in your show notes i'm happy to provide some uh benefits and discounts for the listeners or anyone that uh wants to jump on a november cohort I'll be thrown in a membership, an annual membership on top of that. So um, normally it's, you know, the membership. And if you want to do uh, a cohort, it's an additional cost. So that uh, will be in there. And also if anyone just wants to jump on the membership and just grab the annual, um, we'll be doing 20% off for all the listeners on the show. Okay, great. Awesome. All right, man. Was there, will there be a, um, a code or something for that? Yep. So there'll just be codes for both. So when you when you uh, use them, it'll it'll make that discount. All right, I'll make sure they're in the show notes and I will edit the audio version in before I publish. Um, <laughs> sweet. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. No worries, Mike. Thanks for having me, mate. That was Olympic surf coach Matt Scorringe. The discount code for Matt's Surfing Academy is SurfMastery20, SurfMastery20. And if you sign up to his November remote coaching cohort, leave a comment in the comment box at checkout surf mastery and he will throw in a free membership to his surfing academy the online education platform he has at the art of surfing all details and links to all of that stuff are in the show notes and at surfmastery.com you can check out matt at theartofsurfing.com and the art of surfing on instagram leave a comment on instagram And please give us a rating on the old podcast app that you're using. Until next time, keep surfing.